All right, let's get ready for our, virtu our virtual field trip over Olympic National Park. I'm Lori Ward, I'm CEO at Washington's National Park Fund. I'm very happy to say that we are a strong and vibrant organization. We grow every year and most importantly, we give back more to our national parks. Mount Rainier, North Cascades and Olympic National Parks every year. And it's because of hundreds and, and thousands of people who love the parks as much as we do and show it by, by giving of their hard earned dollars. So all of you who are out there and supporters, we are extremely grateful. Um, we are run managed by a staff of seven and a board of 20, very active, very engaged board of directors, hardworking time, talent and treasures that they give. Our, visions for, our vision for the organization and for our national parks is parks that are strong and vibrant youthful and everlasting. And that keeps us going as we go through the work that we do. Um, the superintendents submit to us at the beginning of each fiscal year, their new priority projects that otherwise would go unfunded. And actually this program was funded a few years ago. And so we're happy to be featuring it today. Uh, let's see. Um, you know, about a year ago, as we all know, COVID hit. And we said to ourselves, what can we do? Uh, let's be creative here. Let's think outside the box. And we decided if people can't get out to their national parks, we are going to bring their national parks to them. And we started our virtual field trips. Every one has been recorded, is on our website. You can go and learn a great deal about many programs at these three national parks. So uh, that's how this came to be. And we continue on with it today. Before we start, I want to restate, um, if you have questions, enter them into the Q&A box. Stick around at the end, who have, those who haven't heard this yet, we have a very special surprise. You're going to want to stick around and be a part of that. Uh, as always, we always end promptly by 1245, and our virtual field trips are offer closed captioning. To gain access, click on the, the box down at the bottom, mark CC. We're glad some of you take advantage of that. And with all of our uh, virtual field trips, they are recorded and then shown later today. They are posted on our website and then connected, linked up on our um, YouTube site as well. So you can go to either of those. So with that, are you ready? Do you have hey, your you pack? Sorry. No worries. Do you have your pack set and your pup alongside to learn about uh, Olympics bark program? You have your hiking boots on. Let's now board the virtual field trip and head on over to Olympic. First, Sarah, we're glad you're with us today. I love working with you. It's always a joy. Sarah's <laughs> been, you know that, Sarah's been superintendent at Olympic since 2013. Uh, before she was superintendent there, she was at beautiful Haleakala National Park on the island of Maui. Uh, Sarah was also superintendent at the American Memorial Park uh, and Saipan and the War in the Pacific National Historic Park on Guam. Over her 28 year career with the National Park Service, she's worked at a lot of wonderful places. We've already mentioned several, but she's beyond that. She's uh, had opportunities at Grand Canyon, Grand Teton, Yellowstone and Yellowstone was where she did her graduate study work, where she studied grizzly bears and the human conflict that sometimes occurs in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So her passion and her, her concern for wildlife in the parks and, and her caring for them goes way back when she was a young pup, no pun intended. She's an avid lover of all things Ursus bear, canine, um, especially, she especially loves her beloved and adorable dog, Border Collie, Jimmy. She says her husband isn't bad either. Sarah has a great sense of humor. You'll get bits and pieces of that today. And with that, I'm happy to have you with us, Sarah, and I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Lori. You're Thanks. welcome. Washington's National Park Fund for the opportunity to spend lunch with all of you. I don't think I have had lunch with this many people um, in a long, long time. So um, I'm excited to talk about the Bark Ranger program. Do we have this slide up? Oh, 
there we are. We're ready to get started. So um, today I'm going to talk with you about the Bark Ranger program at Olympic National Park. And um, we've had this program in place for about six years now. So we'll um, begin with the next slide, please. Oh, that's right. You have to stop for a second. Um, before I talk to you about uh, the Bark Ranger program and show you lots of cute pictures of puppies and beautiful parks, pictures of parks, um, we're going to talk about why we have a Bark Ranger program, uh, fundamentally why we have a Bark Ranger program. So like all federal agencies, the National Park Service gets its marching orders uh, from the executive branch and from Congress and Congress passes laws and the Park Service is really lucky because we have a couple of founding laws that provide our direction and have for over a hundred years now. Next. There are two laws that um, provide us with that direction. One from 1916 and one a little more recently, but still now um, in the past, which is 1970 with the General Authorities Act. And both of those laws tell me as park manager that I am to above all else conserve park resources and values. Next. If you haven't ever had an opportunity to read the National Park Service Organic Act, um, the at least the beginning preamble, I encourage you to do so. It's, it's quite beautiful. Um, and I'm not just saying that because I'm, I'm biased. Um, this language to conserve the scenery and natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein and provide for the enjoyment of the same in such a manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations um, really is something that a law that shows the best of what human beings are in that we would set aside something um, so valuable for the enjoyment of everybody not just for everybody today, but everybody in the future. Now you'll see, um, and it often discussed, um, there's a little bit of tension in that law. People will say, gee, you know, you're here to preserve the environment and to provide for enjoyment. How does that work? Well, a lot of people argued about that over the years. And so in the seventies, Congress in their wisdom gave us some clarification. And so if you go to the next slide, that's the General Authorities Act. And the General Authorities Act, which is also called the Redwoods Act, if you want to look it up, has this language. And it says that the high, given the high public value and integrity of the national park system, that shall not be exercised in derogation of the values and purposes for which these various areas have been established. So what that means in regular speak is that my direction from you, because you're the American people, you elect Congress, Congress tells me what to do through laws and policy. I am charged with protecting the outstanding resources of Olympic National Park and allowing for their enjoyment, but only in so far as they are not impaired um, or um, harmed in a way that makes them unenjoyable. Next. So the thing to take away from the law discussion is that national parks are very special places that we have given, been given direction by Congress to protect the resources and the values within the national park. We've been given direction to allow for visitor enjoyment of those resources, not of um, Ferris wheels and swing sets, but of the resources in the park and only to the point where they remain up in unimpaired. And I just like to say, we protect the park, we allow visitation and nature bat bats last. So um, if ever there's a conflict between natural resources and people uses, nature wins. So um, let's talk about bark rangers. Thanks for being patient with the, the why. Um, next slide. Bark Rangers uh, stands for, of course, bark. B is for bag the poop. Always wear a leash for A, respect wildlife, and K is nowhere to go. 
very important things to remember if you're going to bring, bring your dog with you to Olympic National Park. And um, so we'll talk a little more about this wonderful program, Four Simple Steps. And we'll march through each of them. And we're going to begin with B. So Casey, let's go to the next slide. B stands for the bag of the poop. Please bag the poop. And please take it with you. For the love of God, take the poop with you. I do not know what gets into people and why they like to put the poop in the bag and then leave the bag on the trail. It is, um, it's a mystery. But why is it so important to bag your dog's poop? Seems like it's not really that harmful, right? Casey, let's go to the next slide. We have a poll for you. On average, how much do you think um, a 25 pound dog poops in one day? They're entering their, their perspective, Sarah. I think we're good, Sarah, go for it. Okay, great. Well, let's see. Looks like 25% of you, 13 said 7, 0.75 pounds. Um, and 21 of you, that's 40% said one pound. And boy, 34% said 1.5 pound. I think that the 34% are the people who are responsible for picking it up in your yard because I know that whenever that's my job, I just can't believe that 0.75 pounds, which is the correct answer. You can go to the next slide, Casey. Um, 0.75 pounds of poo in a day is the correct answer, but it does seem like a lot more. So I'm with all of you who, who went to the 1.5. Um, so in 1991, dog poo was actually recognized as an environmental problem. Next slide. And depending on what um, survey you pay attention to, whether it's the census or the Veterinary Medicine Association, um, there's about 80 million dogs in the United States. And so I think 53% of households have a dog. So that's a lot of dog poop. And they classified dog poop in the same category as herbicides and pesticides, which are very dangerous. Next. So let's do a little math just for fun. I've taken some um, wild assumptions here in, in these numbers. The 3.5 million visitors annually is a pretty solid number. The 10% um, of visitors bringing their dog to the park is a little bit of a guess because a lot of people who bring their dogs to the park may not bring their dog may not let their dog out of their car. There are people who live in the communities of Port Angeles and Forks who live right next to the park who walk their dogs in the park every day. So that muddies the water, so to speak. But let's just say for grins that 10% of visitors bring their dog into the park, which is a conservative number. So that's 350,000 dogs times 0.75 pounds of poop saying that the dog is average. And that's, that's 26,000 pounds of poop. Next. Um, yeah, seriously, look away. The next couple of slides are gross. If you're eating your lunch, I wouldn't recommend it. Next. So if it was just your dog's poop and just 26,000 pounds, um, perhaps we would be able to deal with that. Um, but unfortunately, it comes with the other three and a half million visitors that we see every year. And um, not all of them uh, take care of the park the way we would like. And so we spend an awful lot of time cleaning up dog poo, but also cleaning up human poo. And it's a real problem. Next. The other issue with dogs um, is that they can be, they are um, vectors. You'll hear me use that word uh, again a little later in the presentation, but dog poop can transmit hookworms and whipworms. Um, those guys are known as a soil transmitted helminths. 
I always say that incorrectly, helminths. Um, that means they live in the dirt. And so you can pick those up through the dirt um, if your dog has pooped them out or anybody's dog has pooped them out. And they are pretty dangerous. The other thing that's really dangerous about dog poop is coliform bacteria. And I was, when I was looking up a few statistics for this program, I was horrified to find out that there are 23 million coliform bacteria in a single gram of pet waste of dog poop. That's a lot of coliform out there. And somebody gets a prize if they do the math on the 28 grams times 23 million fecal coliform to find out how many of the average dog poop contains. But that's the red fuzzy guys up there in the corner. And that little thing with the teeth, that's a hookworm. Isn't that awful? Yeah. So enough about this. Let's move on to cute dog photos. Um, I think I've made my case as to why picking up your bag poop is the first tenet of being a bark ranger and beginning with B, always bag your poop. So we'll move on now to A, which is always wear a leash. This one is a little more difficult to talk about because I think there are a lot of people out there who have strong opinions about dog leashes and probably about dog leashes in national parks, having your dog on a leash. So everybody out there, what would you, what is the most commonly given excuse that you use when your dog's off a leash? Are people openly admitting that they walk their dog off leash, Lori? They are, they are. Good. Good for them. Yep. Yeah, we I are. Agree. I should say we are because I'm one of them. Yeah. Looks like it's done. Poll's in. Okay. Terrific. Um, let's go to the next slide, Casey. Ah. Well, I've walked my dog outside off leash. And the reason that I often um, say is that my dog is well trained, but the truth of the matter is, is that my dog really loves to run around free. Hey, I get it. Um, I am not here um, in a preachy way. I'm just here to explain why in national parks we're asking for you to behave a little differently with your dog. Um, and that's why um, wearing a leash is really important. So let's um, move on to the next slide. If you care about your dog, um, making sure that your dog's on a leash in a national park is pretty important because we have a number of environments that are pretty dangerous to dogs. Um, and uh, a lot of um, little things that can cut their paws, um, they can cause, dogs can cause harm to wildlife and sensitive cultural resources, to um, plants, invasive plants. We have had dogs who have drowned in the park. We have had people drown trying to get to their drowning dogs in the park. Um, we have a number of rescues and um, dogs also have the ability to transmit the aforesaid diseases that we talked about um, into the ecosystem with wildlife. So if we're managing a national park where nature backs last and when there's a conflict, um, one way that we all can make sure that we'll be able to access our national parks and bring our dogs into a national park is if we all behave ourselves and put our dog on a leash. Um, I was really interesting. I, interested, I found a, sur a survey uh, fairly recently from um, the University of Montana Social Science Survey. And it talked about, um, it did a survey of dogs on beaches and Donor, dog owners expressed um, about see, like 80% moderate support for leashing their dog and were more likely to leash their dog if um, they thought that other beach goers expected them to. So expectations of your fellow park users have an influence on whether you put your dog on a leash. And they also did better if they felt like their dog would harm wildlife which is a really, a very real possibility. So it was interesting. And the sad part of this survey is that it indicated that, um, that 
everybody thought on the survey, it will at least like 80% that everybody else's dog did more damage than their own. Go figure. Next slide. Oh, I, I did, I was gonna mention that the poison oak thing is very real. That was a, an experience that I had. A dog um, on a national forest came into my tent, my dog, and spread um, poison oak all over me. <laughs> and I was a very sad character the next day. So be careful of that. Dogs are vectors. Next slide. So the R in bark is for respect wildlife. Next. And to understand why it's important um, to respect wildlife in national parks, and usually the respect wildlife category is where I talk about why we don't allow dogs on all the trails in national parks and in particularly in um, the Olympic wilderness or the Daniel J. Evans wilderness in Olympic National Park. You have like, there's a lot of science, everyone. Um, just simply Google dog wildlife impact and you will see studies um, for the last 30 years. And most of them are pretty conclusive that in one way or another, dogs on trails can displace wildlife. And it's really, um, if you'd like to think about it this way, uh, it helps me anyway, that it's really an economics issue. So let's just say, you know, you're an elk and you're out there with all of your other elk buddies and you have an elk calf and you want to find um, a place to hide that calf. It's very survival depends on your ability to find the best hiding place possible. Well, if that best hiding place is within 250 yards of a very heavily traveled trail um, and that trail allows dogs, you aren't gonna be able to use that habitat because generally elk calves with calves that they're hiding, bedding down, won't go within that distance of a trail. And so you've effectively removed that habitat from their availability. Um, if a person is a, a person walking down the trail, they don't displace wildlife to nearly the same degree. So it goes in this order and that, this won't be a surprise to any of you, I don't think. So it's, you know, first of all, if you just have a, a loose dog, um, wildlife kind of um, consider it, they think like a coyote. But if you have um, a dog and a person and the dog is off the leash, that's where you get 250 feet of avoidance from a trail um, and sometimes even greater depending on the wildlife species. If you have a dog on a leash, it's much less. Next. So let's talk about stress. This also figures into the economic equation when you are wildlife trying to exist out doors in a national park. So let's have a poll. I think we all know a little bit about stress after this last year. So imagine that you're a wildlife biologist and you've been charged with determining whether a visitor impact, like say a person walking down a trail with a dog on a leash, whether you're gonna allow dogs or not. Um, and you are charged with determining uh, whether that will cause impacts. What would you do? What would you measure? This is an interesting one, Sarah. It's kind of all over. Folks are still entering. <clears throat> there you go. Oh, cool. Well, the, the you know the the correct answer is all of them to some degree, of course. So you're all smart. You're all right. Um, <laughs> but smelling their pee um, is one way and a pretty effective way for people who are trained to do it in um, 
in recognizing whether cortisol, which is a stress hormone, is in an animal's um, system. Uh, there are some wonderful scientists in Yellowstone when I worked there and um, we were studying the effect of snowmobiles on bison and the, um, the, the prevailing belief amongst um, folks who used Yellowstone was that snowmobiles didn't affect bison at all because the snowmobiles would go right by the bison um, and the bison would just stand on the road. And after studying their peat for a while, and my, my friend became an expert pea smeller and could tell by smelling the difference between bison and elk pea and other species, um, and studying the pea and analyzing it, they found that they had really elevated levels of cortisol. So that stress hormone was very, very high, even though the bison exhibited no outward signs of stress whatsoever. And you can equate it, you know, the, for the bison to run away, they would have had to have died, you know, they would dive into a snowdrift, right? That would expend a lot of calories. And the thing to know about bison in the winter in Yellowstone is they don't graze for about six months. They don't eat anything. So they can't afford to lose those calories, um, but still they stay on the road and let those snowmobiles drive by them even though it's causing them stress. Um, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's where they make their living and you and I show up for work every day and that causes us stress too. And so stress has the same negative impacts on wildlife um, that it does on us. Now, I was going to say that I think you probably all now think I'm obsessed with poop and pee, and it's true, I am, um, but only because uh, as a National Park Service manager, I tend to deal with it a lot, um, central to my life. And also, let me um, might add, uh, interesting to note and obvious, I guess, that if you, you can measure um, cortisol, and other stress hormones by taking a blood test. But that's a little more difficult in wildlife. So pee is a great um, way to do that. So, um, you know, being a, a wildlife in the park is kind of a touch and go proposition. Um, when I was studying bears, it wouldn't take much for them not to be able to make it through the winter. You know, losing a, a tooth or um, a claw could be catastrophic. And so the stress that your dog, when it's in a national park, causes for wildlife um, can make it avoid habitat, can cause it to be stressed out, um, and so use more cal calories. It can cause it um, to also habituate, which is when an animal becomes used to human beings. And you might think that's a good thing, but it's really not, um, because animals then put themselves in extraordinary danger. You can do a lot by putting your dog on a leash in a national park and by staying where you are allowed to go. Let's go to know where to go. That's the last tenet of art is know where you can go. And we don't have a ton of places in um, Olympic National Park where you can walk your dog, but we have some spectacular places where you can walk your dog. So. Um, and we have done a lot of the work for you. The places where we allow you to have your dog, if you have your dog on a leash, are places where we believe the impact on wildlife will be minimal, as long as you bag your poop um, and the leash is on. Next. You can find information at both visitor centers at the ranger station that you just saw there. You can also find information um, uh, from the campground hosts and um, dogs are allowed in national parks in most campgrounds and on roadways. And at Olympic National Park, they are allowed on the Peabody Creek Trail, which is a lovely um, three mile trail, three miles or so, um, sort of parallels the Hurricane Ridge Road, um, a beautiful little trail that your dog is allowed on. Uh, also, now that the um, Elwha Olympic Hot Springs Road is closed while we do the environmental assessment and get um, look at road reconstruction there. You can walk your dog on the roadway um, for several miles and it's really a nice walk. We just opened the Spruce Railroad Trail 
um, which goes around the backside of Lake Crescent, and you'll be hard pressed to find a more lovely experience than the Spruce Railroad Trail in Olympic National Park on a sunny day. And then, of course, there's the dogs. Dogs are allowed on um, some pretty good stretches of our beaches. One up at Rialto Beach, you can walk a half mile um, up to Ellen Creek, and there's a sign there that lets you know that not to go any farther. Um, and then, then the beaches between Ho and Quinault, which is where we get the majority of our doggies. Next. I just love this picture. Aren't they the cutest? Next. So just a few things to leave you with before you enter into Olympic National Park with your bark ranger. Next. Visit your vet. That's the first thing to do. Um, veterinarians can be really, really um, helpful uh, in helping you get your dog ready for a hike. Um, they can also tell you if your dog is fit enough to hike. And the first clue would be if you're not fit enough to do the hike, I don't think that your dog is. Um, dogs need to be um, conditioning as well, and particularly their little paws. Um, paws can are subject to all sorts of abrasions and cuts. Um, we come across it a lot during the summertime with dogs that have been injured. There, is, there are a number of different salves that you can purchase um, that will toughen up your dog's pads. They are used for working dogs in the West, for herding dogs. Uh, and also they have booties. Um, I have a couple of booties in my backpack and my day pack that I carry with me all the time, just in case Jimbo gets um, something wrong with a paw. Uh, you know, and things happen that you never expect. As somebody who uh, hikes all the time, I was with my dog in, um, outside of Yellowstone and hiked across a flat area. Turned out they were alkaline soils and the alkali burned, nearly burned the pads off of my dog's two front, two front feet. It was really horrible um, and quite expensive and, and, and costly. So, um, and poor guy was miserable for about two weeks. So remember that, protect the paws. So just like people have 10 essential hiking um, tools that you should carry in your backpack, whether it's a day hike or a 10 mile hike or an overnight hike and your dog does too. Next. There are some things to take with you. Most people recommend that when you're in the backcountry for an extended period of time that you filter your water for your dog. The dogs are susceptible to Giardia as well. And that's a bacteria that can give you terrible bacteria, bac diarrhea and it takes a long time um, to uh, go away. And uh, food always carries snacks. A tip for your shelter, if you're taking your dog in a tent, watch those toenails because it will tear your $500 tent right up. Don't forget your poop bags. And if you find yourself on a national forest in the backcountry and you can't bag the poop for some reason, you need to bury it the same way you would bury your own in a cat hole, six inches deep at least and away from a water source. Um, your safety, uh, always have a microchip or identification on your dog at all time, carry your booties, um, talk to your vet about a first aid kit. Uh, so many of the things in the essential canine hiker list um, can be accomplished with these thumbs. So make sure your dog has at least one set with them and that they're on the other end of a leash. One thing that a lot of people forget about with dogs um, is sunscreen. My dog gets his nose burnt all the time by the sun. Um, there are no PABA, um, PABA sunscreens that are recommended for dogs against your vet. And um, a lot, there are new GPSs apparently that you can attach um, to your pal. And take along a kind of a, a pad or something for your dog to lie on, even on a day hike, laying on the ground really sucks the, um, heat right out of them and the energy as well. And Jimmy told me to remind you again, take snacks, snacks, lots of snacks. So here's a good one. Um, when you're out there hiking with your dog, what, how can you tell if your dog gets dehydrated?
I do not know the answer to this one, Sarah. It's a good one. Well, you know, I probably, um, Lori, I would have guessed all of the above. Um, damp foot pads, not so much, although that is a sign that they're stressed out um, and nervous. Um, dry, sticky gums and a loss of skin elasticity. And apparently if you just take the back of your dog's um, neck and you give it a pinch, the um, quite a bit of skin and fur, if it doesn't release uh, right away and it's not elastic, that would be one really quick way to tell on the trail. Uh, apparently dry, sticky gums also. Next. So bark, bag your poop, Always wear a leash, respect wildlife, and know where you can go. Who wants to be an Olympic National Park bark ranger? Huh. I wonder. Ah, the famous bark ranger wall at Claylock Ranger Station. Make sure you stop in there. Sarah, did you come up with this program? You know, um, <laughs> well, I don't like to brag. But um, yeah, um, Rainy McKenna and I, one afternoon in 2015, came up with the Bark Ranger program. And thanks to, um, remember the Great Ideas grants, mm -hmm. Lori? Mm -hmm. yep. They were small grants um, that allowed us to um, implement great ideas. And so uh, Rainy and I used this as a, a way, we call it, um, it's called social policing. It's really just a way um, to educate the public in a fun way to get them to change their behaviors to protect the park. That's a great program. I think it should be national. Okay, we're ready to yeah, jump in. Them. I agree. We're ready to jump into our little surprise for everyone. Uh, let's see, we're looking for five of you to enter your names and become kind of panelists. And when you continue on, you'll understand what we mean. But if five of you would enter your names in the chat box, Sarah, or I'm sorry, uh, my wonderful colleague Sharon's going to pull your name up and pull your picture up. And you're going to become a panelist with us as we start quite literally an official. And this really is seriously official. We got some good folks coming in. Way to go. Um, a swearing in of Bark Rangers. Just like junior, how many of you are in our audience are junior rangers and have memories of being sworn in? I'm thinking we're starting to see people popping up, which is exciting. So um, thank you, Sarah, sure others. With that, I am going to turn it over to you, Sarah, to begin an official swearing in of Bark Rangers. Sarah? Hey, thanks. Um, and so do you have, um, I know we're going to swear folks in, but do they know about the cool tag? Do you want me to explain it or would you like to? Well, I can, um, I can certainly explain it. So we okay, have, great. um, uh, when you come into a ranger station, uh, and you have your pup with you, uh, you can ask to be a bark ranger. Um, and I think there's the bark ranger um, yep. card. And on the inside, it has the tenants of bark ranger. Oh. Golly, what a cutie patootie. <laughs> um, and on the inside, it asks you, um, it says, my bark ranger, where you insert your dog's name, and I promise to follow the rules of bark, B-A-R-K, when visiting Olympic National Park. And then you sign your name. And once you do that and you're sworn in to be a bark ranger, then you are awarded this very cool bark ranger <laughs> Olympic National Park tag for your dog. Hi, Sarah. Welcome. <laughs> Sarah Martin and Michael Walsh. We see your pups. Cool. Yep. So shall we swear some folks in? I think we shall. And, and all of you, this is, we, Olympic takes this really seriously. You must be present to participate. And afterwards, like Sarah said, you will be, um, you will receive the official Bark Ranger tag and the card. You know, we'll take care of getting that off to you. 
Um, so thank you. And this goes beyond the folks just on screen. It's to everybody who is with us today. So um, with that, Sarah, go ahead and start the swearing in. All right. So you'll all have to repeat after me. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear. Swear. That my bark ranger. That my bark ranger. Didn't say your dog's name. Oh, Griffin. Um, will follow the rules of bark. B A R K. Ag follow the rules of bark. Always wear a leash. Always wear a leash. Respect wildlife. Respect wildlife. Protect the wildlife. And know where you can go. Know where, know where we can go. So by the power vested in me as superintendent of Olympic National Park, I bequeath you all bark rangers. Thank you for joining the program. And thank you everyone for bringing your pups up on screen. Michael. Really great to see them. Michael, what a great dog. <laughs> he did so well. He did. Yep. No. Yep. Hey, you guys are the very first, I think, and probably the only bark, virtual bark rangers um, out there. We do take it very seriously. You have to be present um, to get your bark ranger tag, but we're just going to do it a little special celebration today in honor of all of the wonderful things that Washington's National Park Fund does for the parks. So. Annie, good to see your you. pup up there. That's great. We have one more minute. I'm going to ask a few quick questions. Uh, Everyone, do you know about Craig Romano's book? It's a great book that tells you where you can take your dogs around the park. Sarah, great tips today on, on the different trails. Uh, let's see, I'm glad, it, I love that you shared that, that this started at Olympic. Um, are you seeing an increase in dogs this year since COVID and yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. lots and lots of dogs. Yep. Hey, Lori, lots, lots. Can, yes. Lori, can you have everybody click on the form who wants to be a bark ranger? There's a form in the chat box. And if the first 30 people to sign that form can get a little bark ranger tag. So everyone see that? Go to the uh, chat box, scroll down, and you will see the form. We'll work with you, so, so don't worry, but um, get that filled out. Sharon, anything else to add to that? No, just it's only good for today, though. Just just right. during the field trip, because it we right. need Sarah here to make it official. Right. If you're watching on YouTube. I can't help you. That's right, and that's a good point to say. Um, someone's yeah. asking about Craig Romano. Craig Romano, R O M A N O, great author in the Northwest, and he has a great book. Um, the Kula cloth. Someone's mentioning we're we're kind of going like this now. The Kula cloth, the um, the musical Mountaineers, they put this together, and it's actually um, a pea cloth that you can use in the wilderness. Um, and shameless plug, they're good friends of Washington's National Park Fund, so good plug there. Shameless. Yeah, I think we're all set. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us. If you want to support this program, it's growing, and these dollars just don't happen. And so, if you're interested. Let us know and we'll make sure that that your gifts go right to the program. It would help them out because it is expanding and it is popular. And most importantly, it's so important. Sarah, great job today. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, everyone, this will be up online and um, it will be later today. Uh, be in touch. Continue to follow our our um, virtual field trips. Thanks to Casey, who's behind the scenes. Thanks to Sharon, who also is behind the scenes. And most importantly, thank you, Sarah, for today. We really appreciate this. It's great. My pleasure. Thank you. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for all you do for us, Lori. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure. Take care, everyone. Be in touch.